friends and welcome back to my channel. My name is Tammy Ernest and I am a long arm quilter and here on my channel I like to share customer finishes as well as my own personal projects and I have so much to share with you today. So first of all you're going to notice that I'm in a new space this week and um, this is some exciting news. You are not seeing double. This um, is my old older <laughs> um, handy quilter long arm and over here I have a new one. So in, within the last week I have purchased a second long arm. My business is to the point that in order to get quilts turned around in a decent amount of time I needed to do that. And so within the last week I have got a second machine set up and running. So what had to happen for that uh, to occur was if you've seen my previous video where I showed you my sewing space, my long arm was in an upstairs room that was a, a converted bedroom. Bedroom. It's actually we have we, we live in an old farmhouse. So the upstairs walls are the, um, the slope ceilings It's a converted attic that was made into the second floor And so in order to accommodate a second long arm, we actually had to swap some rooms So the room that I'm in now you may recognize at least that side of it because that's where I would do my filming um, prior to this and the other part of this room was actually my husband and I's bedroom so I each week I would film um, on half of the bedroom half of the room my videos and the other half was um, where we slept at night so in order to accommodate both long arms what we did was we swapped rooms so this is now my long arm room and we have moved our bedroom upstairs I am really really enjoying it um, if you understand an old farmhouse, many, many times there was uh, usually your largest bedroom was on the main floor, and that's the way it was for, for us. Raising seven kids here in this, um, in this house, we had a boy's room and a girl's room upstairs, and then the third bedroom upstairs for a long time was not even finished. And once we finished it off, it um, for a while was our oldest son's bedroom. When he went away to college, I then took it over <laughs> as my sewing space and just kept adding more and more to it. Originally didn't have a long arm, um, but in 2011 is when I bought my first long arm and turned that space into my long arm room. So I have expanded now into this room. I am so enjoying it. First of all, I'm enjoying our bedroom being upstairs. It's the uh, first time our bedroom has ever been on the back side of the house. It's cozy, it's quiet. I am super enjoying it. I don't hear all the noise from downstairs. If I'm in my bedroom, I feel like I've got my own little respite now instead of being on the main floor. So I'm enjoying that. I'm also enjoying this room for both long arms. I have several large windows in this room. Um, it's really nice to be able to work on both long arms at the same time. I'm just getting going. It's only been a few days that I've had this up and running. Um, so it's a lot of hands-on, but there's no downtime. So meaning when I'm working on one, the other one's running. Um, and then, you know, once I get this one going, then this one may stop, be ready to, to move down the way. Um, so it's a lot of hands-on, but it's getting things done in a shorter amount of time and getting a lot more things moving through here. So you can see the closet back there. That's where all of the current, that's two levels or, you know, two, um, whatever you want to say, two hang-up bars there. And the, the closet actually extends beyond what you can see in the doorway there. It extends all the way to the end of the wall, and that is full of customer quilts. So I am working through them. And I just thought, well, um, my plan is, uh, because my setup has changed a little bit, my plan is to drape the quilts over this long arm. I'll scoot back a little bit and I'll drape the quilts over this long arm, kind of change my angle a little bit so that I can um, point out things on the quilts and then get in closer and show you the pantographs. But before I lay those out, I would just thought I would answer a few questions that I get a lot of times about um, just some frequently asked questions that I get. So, and I may, um, how about I just jump up and I'll change the camera angle here and I'll uh, show you some things on my long arm. We'll do a little bit of a hands-on tutorial here for a few minutes and then I'll get back and show you some of my personal projects as well as customer finishes this week. So I thought I would start out just giving you a very quick um, tour of my room. I am still in the process of 
um, putting things up on the walls and filling up my shelves and things like that. But this is the view that I look at um, when I am filming. So this looks straight out the front window. You can see our porch out there and um, it's a very gloomy day, but um, that's my view from the from where I am filming. And then if I swing you around, this is what you were seeing just a few minutes ago. You're seeing this long arm here. And so it's just one big square room. I have a nice big window back there as well. My bookcases that I need to fill up and decorate. Then I have a closet with all the long arm. That's the view you used to see before. I'm planning on filling up that whole, um, the bench right there with all of my wide backings and kind of changing that look there. And then my second long arm is over here. I did purchase the exact same machine. I have another big window there. So I did purchase the exact same machine. This one was a floor model in a quilt store and uh, only had a million stitches on it where my, <laughs> where my other long arm has like 80 some million on it. So I did purchase the exact same machine. It's on a 12 foot table. It is an Amara with Pro Stitcher. So my, um, the reason I did that was so that my learning curve was very slight. Um, it is a little more updated, um, you know, a few updates, but basically works the same. I tell people it's kind of like siblings, you know, they have the same parents, but they have their own personalities. That's the way my machines are <laughs> as well. Um, they're very similar, but and they, will, they both have their own personalities. So let me answer a few questions that I get a lot of time when I am, um, that you send in to me about long arm quilting. One question I had recently was, what foot did you use on the hometown quilt? So the hometown quilt was that, uh, the Lori Holt quilt um, that had all the applique houses. And I use the same foot on that that I use all the time. So I use a glide foot. This is a handy quilter product. It is the scoop bowl. And I use this whether it's an applique quilt or whether it's a pieced quilt. And let me show you why. Because some quilts just like this right here, do you see how this, um, this is a flying geese unit, but there's just a little bit of give in this fabrics right here. And with a glide foot, the glide foot will not get caught on those. Where if I used a regular, um, you know, open toed or a metal um, circle type hopping type foot, it might get caught on some fabrics like that. So with the glide foot, it just goes right over the top. You do have to watch occasionally, you know, sometimes on a border or on an edge, you know, like um, an edge here and may catch it and flip it over but very rarely. So that is the foot that I always use. Um, stitch length. A lot of people have asked me what stitch length I am using for my quilting. I do a 12 on my stitching and um, I use that on both machines. I also use red snappers. Now um, I have red snappers on this machine. That's what I've always used. Um, I have not purchased a second set of red snappers at this point. You can see the red snapper right here. So those of you not familiar with long arm quilting machines, you um, to pin the backing on or to attach the backing to the leaders, this is my leader here that's um, Velcroed to the bar, then to attach the quilt backing or the quilt itself to those leaders, you can pin it, you can use magnets, or you can use these red snappers. So red snappers, there is a red tubing inside of this case right here. And then this, then I would drape, um, I would line up the quilt uh, over that edging there and then snap down the, the outer casing onto that and that holds the quilt backing um, taut. And so uh, nice and tight to that bar. I was given, um, many years ago when I was first adding red snappers to my machine, I was searching YouTube and found the advice to actually do the um, casing a little smaller. So if you, I think you can see here, there is a line right here where there is a casing. You can see the white stitching along that line. That was the original stitching line that Handy Quilter puts into the leader so that you have a casing right here. I um, 
I don't even remember how, who or where I got that information, but was to run um, another stitching line in a little closer. And it, to be honest, it could be, it could come in even closer than this. And to do it in a bright colored thread so that when you're lining up your quilt backing, you can line it right up against that, um, that stitch line and it's very easy to, uh, to see one and um, very easy to get your quilt backing straight on there. Um, I have not done this to my new machine, the leaders on my new machine yet, and I need to because I keep lining it up with this white stitch line and it's just way too big. I'm losing too much um, fabric, a backing fabric in that amount of space. So I, on my new leaders, I will go through and I will actually bring this stitch line in a little bit um, so that that casing is just a little bit tighter. You can see up here on this one, the same thing, that red tubing, you can kind of see the bulge right there. And I have a good thumbs length in between that and the the stitched line that I put in there. So I'll bring that in some of my new on my new leaders. At this point, a set of red snappers comes with three of these inner tubings and then enough um, outer casing snaps to do your 12 foot table. You can buy them in whatever lengths of table you have. But it comes with three of these inside tubings because you have three separate bars. I do. I only attach red snappers use for my backing. My quilt top, I always do. I always pin it onto the leader. So what I have done with my new machine is I have moved one of those um, inside um, red tubings to the other machine. So I have two. I actually have two on my new machine and one on this machine so that I am having to pin the quilt backing onto, sorry for the movement. <laughs> so on this machine, I have a red snapper on the back bar so I can snap the backing onto that. And I am then pinning the backing onto this front bar here. In the other machine, I have red snappers in the this bar and the back bar. Um, so I really don't need them. Another question I get is batting. Um, face up, face down, what is correct? This batting was sent in by a client. You can see the um, holes. These are actually going down. So your batting is um, needle punched, meaning uh, you know thousands of needles are pressed through that batting to, um, to compress it and to hold it together and the direction that the needles go, the needles are going down in this one because I can see it puncturing down to the, to the backing. Um, let me see if I can pull this up. And you can see the other side. Not great lighting here. So you can see how the, the points are popping out of this side and they're going down on this one. I almost always, have done um, gone in the same so I've almost always put the dimpled side um, up and the reason is that I've done that in the past is because my needle is going down so it would be going down in the same direction that it was the batting was originally um, needle punched in that's the way I've I've just always done it recently um, <laughs> my batting comes in rolls and you can see some of those under there when um, the right side is out, meaning the it was um, needle pressed going into that way. So when I'm, let me say, I've just been experimenting with flipping the batting the other way because when it comes off the roll, it's much easier just to flip it open where the, um, what I would consider the back side would be up. I've not had any difficulties with it. Um, I'll let you know so far it's been fine, but just because the way it comes off of the roll it's easier just to flip it open and put it into the quilt than it is to unfold the whole thing to get that top part on. I don't know if that's making sense, but um, so just as a recap, normally I would do where I would go in the same direction that it was needle punch. So the little dimples going down into it, that's what I would put on top and the little points coming up out of it, I would put on the underneath side. Sorry about that lighting. Terrible lighting right there. Okay, so that's a little bit. This quilt right here, this is a quilt of valor that I'm working on for Loretta. I am using the Star Spangled Banner um, pattern. And it's ready for a new pass. 
And let me see if I can get in here close so you can see some of the stitching. So I am using a cream color thread. to blend in with those cream backings or the background fabric there. So she's got flying geese units. You know, you've got a square within a square type thing here and then flying geese units to make a larger star. It's a neat pattern. So this quilt measures about 45 by 55, something like that. It's got a couple borders on the outside and Loretta is um, doing this for Quilts of Valor. All right. I will get the camera set back up and we will talk about some of my own personal projects. All right, so let's start with some of my own personal projects. Before I even get to that, I wanted to share um, something I received in the mail this week. This is so exciting. Tammy Blaylock had sent a message saying that she had two of the, the Sew and Stitch calendars by Lori Holt and asked if I would want the second one. She had purchased two, thinking that she was going to use both of them for uh, different um, um, keeping track of different things and decided not to oh, there's a thunderstorm outside um, and decided not to and ask if I would um, enjoy receiving this so Tammy graciously sent this to me I so appreciate this Tammy is also in Indiana she's a Hoosier like I am and she has her own website where she makes project bags so if you're a cross stitcher or if you like to take um, put in your hand projects into project bags you want to check out her um, website. It's called Creative Country Girl and I have attached uh, her information down below in the notes. You can go there to look for that. But thank you Tammy. I am so excited to get this into my binder and start using that and I'll be able to keep track of um, my progress each day and what I'm working on each day and um, now I can show you some of the things that I have been working on. One of my projects for 2024 is the temperature quilt. This is um, the cottage temperature quilt is what I am working on. This is a free pattern by Fat Quarter Shop. You can go there and uh, download this for yourself. What I like about this temperature quilt is that they put it into houses and I think this is just adorable. So um, I, with this I am doing a couple of trying a few new things that I've not done before. I'm using linen fabric and with the linen, I am also um, best pressing that linen prior to cutting and sewing with it. Um, linen is known to shrink just a little bit, and so in my studies or, or my um, research on it, it said it's best to starch it um, or you know do something so that, um, not that you have to, but if you want to pre-shrink it or um, starch it so that you don't have as much fraying, and I'm not a big starcher, and so I decided to best press all of my fabrics first, and that is going well. It keeps them, I would say, crisp, not stiff, and so that, that's going well. So I'm um, using linen for one. I am using best press, you know, spray starch prior to, best press is a starch and sizing, so not straight starch, but... Um, so I'm using that prior to my cutting process. And the third thing I'm doing is using uh, triangle paper on a roll. This is done by Fat Quarter Shop. They're, um, it's So Emma line. Uh, it, it's So Emma by Fat Quarter Shop. And this is the way it comes. It comes in six and a half in, in, inch lengths and you can get whatever size triangle squares you're doing. So I'm using the two inch finished triangles. And this is what I've done with my pattern. So I've shown you before my colorways. This is all the linens that I am using. And I have um, I did all but the last one just because we, we never get to 106 degrees here in Indiana. It'll happen this summer just because I say we never. But I've laid out all of my fabrics. I have starched all of these. This was a fat quarter bundle of linen. And so I have starched all of the pieces of this. I just cut off a small little sample and put on here so that I know what um, what fabrics I need. And then if you notice at the top, I have also just labeled these with um, an alphabet. And I'll explain why I did that in just a minute. So then I am also using um, a white linen for my... Um, for the second half of the of the half square triangle. So this is what I did. I took the, um, I cut my, the color, so this is one of the purples, 
in a six inch strip off of my fat core of off of my fat quarter. I also cut a six inch strip from the linen yardage that I have in the white. I put right sides together and then I cut a strip of the triangle paper that will fit within that um, section. So this has two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. So I'm making um, actually, so that would make 28 half square triangles because it has 14 blocks, but each one is going to create two. Uh, so did I count that right? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. And each one's going to create two. So with it, with doing this, this creates 28 half square triangle blocks. So I am stitching this. You can see um, I missed a line. I can see now. But I would just start down here at the bottom and follow the line. So you stitch on the dotted lines. So I just followed this all the way up, stitched as long as I could, all the way up, all the way up. And then I turned and came back down, all the way down. And I can see I missed two right here somehow. Um, and and maybe a couple there too. So I do need to go back and finish that. Maybe I pulled this out prior because I can see I need to go this length now. So I've stitched over here and I just need to do this length right there now. I just didn't finish it all. So I have these laid out. I have several cut. No, I have several stitched. And I just did this one after another. I was just putting them through the machine. It does say the half square triangle paper um, does say to decrease your stitch length to 1.5 so um, but then you can just run them through so I have stitched several this one's stitched and I actually have pulled out the pins already that's how I held the papers with the fabrics as I just pinned them so these are ready to be cut apart and these are ready to be sewn the pins are in there but they have not been sewn yet so you can see the different colors I've started with most of the cool colors we've had so back in January, we had some very, very cold days. Here in February, it's been very mild. We've had even almost up to 60 several times um, in the past week. So I've kind of done those colorways at this point is what I'm working on. So I've um, done all the way up through, I haven't done any of the greens, so I've gone up to at least 50. So I may have to go ahead and do some of the greens this week to get those done as well. So um, Fat Quarter Shop has, I don't have that, paper with me but it has listed in the pattern a website that you can go to you put in your zip code and it gives you the highs and lows you can go back and do prior months if you're just now getting started and so I actually went in and I just for January and I just copied and pasted um, the high temperature that's what I'm using for mine I'm using the high temperature for the day some people will do high temperature on half of the block and low temperature on the other half or they're doing an average temperature with just then a white um, triangle on the other side I'm doing a high temperature and then all white fabric for all of the second um, half of the triangle block there all right so why do I have the alphabet here? <laughs> so um, one section of these that I already sewed and I have cut apart. And, and I've cut apart. I have not yet pulled the paper off. I have not yet um, pressed them open. But I wanted a way to keep track of these without having to do um, just one a day or without having to um, lose track of which color goes to which, because I can match it up. You know, I can look at the at the color that it is and I can match it up. That's this one right here. But what I did is I went ahead and put a, a letter, assigned a letter to each color, and then I have written on the triangle paper that letter. All right, and so my plan is, I've only done it with this, this one section here, um, this one set at this point, but I have all of these. Some of them I've I've cut apart. Some of them are still into the in the square part. And then I grabbed this old. I have this old recipe box, you know. And so right now I have just um, the index dividers here. They actually have numbers on the other side, so I need to find my Lori Holt letters. And I was going to put letters on this side. And just do A through, how many do I have? A through T on the letters here. Or I could find some new, um, I know that 
these come with ones that already have letters on it. I could do that if I wanted to buy some more. Otherwise, I'll just use my little stickers and assign the letters. So behind the H one, then I would put all of these H blocks. And then each day, or if the end of the week, then I want to work on the um, the house, then I, I can look at the temperature for that day. I have that on a separate sheet and I can just pull out those blocks that I need for that day. So I'm kind of doing some prep work at this point, um, getting all of these sewn together, all of the triangle paper, and then cutting them to the point, I can at least cut them down into squares to put them in here. And that's 28 blocks of each color. And so some of them I'm gonna use a little bit more. Uh, others, there may be some that I have to go back and do a second set of um, triangle, a separate sheet of this, and that'll be fine, but I've got a good start for a while. So that's where I'm at at this point. I've not actually created any blocks yet. I'm still doing prep work and I'm keeping track of the temperature. Like I said, I went and I just downloaded all of January. I actually did up through February up to the current date so I can get started on this. Um, but if you wanted to do it even just once a month instead of doing it by day, you could just go to that website and copy the temperatures and then sit down and do all the, you know, one house um, a month. And then for months like January that have 31 days, you're actually making a tree block and, um, and that'll be separate. That's not a half square triangle. That is um, a full square with uh, easy corner triangles on it. So I'll do, need to do that part for January. But it's coming together. I'm super excited to get started on this one. So I have not actually pressed open any of the triangle paper to know whether I'm getting really accurate blocks or not. I'll keep you posted on that part as well. Like I said, this is the first time I've used triangles on a paper. Is that how you say it? Triangles on a paper. I've always just um, layered two squares together and, you know, and done it on my sewing machine. So we'll see if this is faster, whether I think it's worth the effort and the time to do this, and if it gives me more precise measurements. So that's what I've been doing on my temperature quilt. All right, several weeks ago I told you that I was um, working on a commissioned quilt, and I am still trying to get that out the door. So I'm doing this Meadowlark song. This is a Kansas Trouble pattern. I no longer do commissioned quilts. My long arm business has um, and now takes over my full time, so I'm not able to do this, but um, I am finishing up this one. So this is, like I said, Meadowlark's um, song. This is a Kansas Troubles quilters pattern. This measures 72 by 72. And someone asked me recently if I was using the called for um, materials. No, I am not. The called for is a Meadowlark pond layer cake and as well as additional yardage. I am instead using Clover Blossom. If you know Kansas Troubles, all of their colorways are very, very similar. Um, all of their lines uh, you know, are interchangeable, so Clover Blossom is a current line that I was able to find and to use. Tom did not want any black. This one uses blue, actually, in the picture. Um, yeah, some quilts, that, a picture he had sent me actually used black. He didn't want any of the black. So we have um, done the blue, and let me show you. So this weekend, this past weekend, we were up in Wisconsin. My son plays volleyball for um, his university, and they had a parents' uh, weekend, and so nice dinner, and then a game, and introduction at the game, and all of that. So, um, but because we were in a hotel for several days, and I could not take my long arm with me, I might as well do some other sewing. So I actually packed my art boxes full of, um, I took way more projects than I was able to complete, but I wasn't sure how much time, how much downtime we were gonna have. Obviously in the late evenings um, we would have time, but because he's in college, he still has school to do, right? And so we were there for several days, but we can't spend the entire amount of time with him. So part of the time we actually drove on up to Primitive Gatherings. He's only about an hour south of um, where Primitive Gatherings is beautiful place. If you have not been there, you need to go. Not only does Lisa Bonjean have a shop um, there, which is beautiful. The quilts hanging up, the ceilings are probably 30, 40 foot tall. I don't know. They're humongous. Quilts in there, um, so much inspiration. 
kits and um, fabrics for everything you see, just a wonderful place. But not only that, she also has a retreat center. And so uh, my husband and son and I walked over to the retreat center and uh, were able to look around and lo and behold, Lisa Bonjean herself was in there. She gave us a short little tour through some of the rooms. Um, the retreat center sleeps 25. Every bed has an antique quilt that is from the personal collection of Lisa Bonjean. They have a cook on staff, so if you go there for one of their retreats or you book your own retreat there, um, then lunch and dinner is included with your package deal. They have a huge open common area where everyone has table and light. The day we were there, there were some people sewing, there were some people um, working, they were painting barn stars, and so that was really cool. They have um, a little rest area, a little kitchenette if you want to use that, and they have um, some seating area like couches and stuff around a fireplace just very homey just a wonderful atmosphere and what was so fun is while we were there um, I had uh, uh, Lori from Peoria come up and introduce herself and say she watches me on YouTube and that was so exciting to be able to meet some viewers especially when I'm way way from home um, she was there doing a retreat and so it was so nice of Lori to introduce herself and thank you for watching Lori thank you for introducing yourself when you saw me up there and also I was able to meet Michelle of Farm Girl Dry Goods. Um, what a pleasure. It was so fun to, to be able to meet with her as well and, and, um, and talk and it was so fun. So such a fun time. Anyway, back to being in the hotel. I took my sewing machine, I took my projects and I was able to spend several hours um, working on these um, like Saturday morning. We didn't have anything to do and so I worked for several hours while the boys went off and did some shopping of their own. And then in the late evenings, I was able to work. So I'm able, I have all my blocks together. This is ready to be put together. So let me show you my progress on this. So there are, I've shown you um, some of these blocks before. So there, um, I have all of these in different colorways. So you have the red and you have the gold and the blue ones, I'm not showing you all of them, just kind of a um, little bit of each. Anyway, so those four different colorways, and then the way it's put together, you can see we've got this diagonal um, look to it, and so then you attach, the next to those, these blocks will go. And so this is all, um, each one of these, this is actually four, if you can kind of see, nine patches put together. So all of the nine patches are done with a uh, with five dark and four light ones. And then you join those four together to create this larger block. You um, add on the triangles on the corners and then an easy corner triangle on, the, on those so that when we put the whole quilt together, it gives that whole diagonal look to it. So all of those blocks are finished. This is ready to be put together. I even finished all of the outer border blocks. So you see around the outer border, we have these. Um, let me show you those. I had those in my enamel tin. This packed great. So I put this right into one of the, the art bin boxes um, and it worked great. So I still have some that are chain pieced together. This is how I do my, uh, do my sewing. So you can see this is one of the blocks um, so this started out as a rectangle and then I added the easy corner triangles on these two. I pressed those open and I cut away the extra fabric and then I ran this through and did the easy corner triangles on the second, on the bottom side of it. So I do as much quilting as I can or much piecing as I can on each block before needing to press it. Um, and actually in the hotel, I didn't take an iron and a pressing uh, mat. What I did was just use the iron and the ironing board that was in the hotel room. Set it up right next to me um, and use that. It was actually, it's, it was a sunbeam iron, but it was actually very hot. It worked really well and um, I was so glad. And then these are um, some corner pieces. So I just, I just strip piece right through there. And then um, after everything's on there that needs to be, then I pressed them open and I have a whole, whole tin full of these. All of these are the rectangle blocks that go all around the around the edges. All of them. So the middle fabric 
is different. There's like four or five, I can't remember how many. But all of the light, the low volume prints is what I used for the centers of these rectangles, which is the same as I did on on these. So the light, the low volume prints in here are all mismatched. They're all different ones from the collection. This, these triangles were done, you cut them as a big square and then cut them in half and you attach it on um, the diagonal there. No problem with that, um, but they're all the same print. So that is all together this weekend. That will get all put together and hopefully next week have that on the long arm and get the binding done on that one. So that's all the personal projects I have done. How about I lay out some quilts on the long arm and we will talk about some customer finishes. So this first one is a table runner by Loretta and um, very nice all Christmassy fabrics, very um, bright and cheerful, a lot of um, metallic type looking, the, the bright gold and things, very pretty. So this table runner is all done in squares, it's set on point and then I did not cut the um, backing away from this, a lot of times I trim up quilts but I wanted Loretta to be able to trim up exactly where she wanted because not all the points were um, the same around it and so I wanted her to do that so it's a little harder to see the edges even though there is um, there are some setting triangles right here let me see so there you can see the the cream color setting triangles right there so we used a cream color thread on this one it does have a cream color backing on it all this Cupid Angels on the back. And this pantograph I used is called Mistletoe. And um, I use this on a lot of quilts, not necessarily all Christmas ones, but this one had a very Victorian feel to me, very, um, a lot of swirls in the pattern. And um, this pantograph has a lot of that, it has a lot of swirls, very elegant. And um, by the name, it doesn't have to be Christmas, but on this one, we obviously did. So, um, Really, really pretty. Very nice. Turned out really cute. Move on to uh, Loretta's second quilt. So I really showed you Loretta's first quilt. It was the, the uh, Quilts of Valor one that was on, still on the long arm. And so um, those first two are by Loretta. And now this one is an antique quilt. She said this was her mother-in-law. So this has been put away. So it's her husband's mom had made this. And um, it's all vintage fabric. So clothing, um, you know, table cloths or things, um, maybe even some aprons and that kind of thing, all different fabrics. This is so fun. So she's just grouped two fabrics together, cut them in squares, and pieced them into a nine patch, you can kind of see, and then all of those nine patches are just put right together. So an antique quilt top, um, and a nice, um, or a good hint would be if you're wanting this long arm quilted. Now this one, all the stitching was fine, maybe a little frayed around some of the edges. So it'd be a good idea to do maybe just a running stitch or a stay stitch all around the edge of your quilt, just so none of those seams come apart. Um, but this one stitched up really well. There was no, nothing, you know, none of the fabrics in the middle of the quilt were deteriorating at all. There are no holes, nothing was coming apart. Um, it just was a really nice, um, still very nicely done. A large size. This measures 72 by 88 and all of those squares, those finish at maybe one and a half inches. So very, very tiny done. So for the pantograph, because it's an antique quilt, 
Um, I just feel like the best thing is to use more of a, a vintage antique type pantograph. So I went with the Baptist fan on this one. Really not that noticeable on the front. Loretta had a muslin backing on it and man, does that not look cool. <laughs> I just love the texture you can see when, uh, when you have basically a whole cloth quilt is what this ends up being. So the Baptist fan, this is all a cream color thread, blends right in with that uh, muslin backing there. Um, just very, very pretty. Love this. I did not trim up the edges on this quilt either because some of the edges were a little frayed. Um, I didn't want to cut into those antique fabrics, and so I wanted Loretta to be able to trim off where she wanted um, just because there was some fraying on the edges, and I don't know where she's wanting to cut those at. So um, left that part to her, but this is Baptist Fan. This is um, the Easy Baptist Fan. This is done by Three Sisters. And it is super easy. It lines up really well. I had no trouble with this one at all. You can see the point. You could bring this down a little farther if you wanted. We've talked about how um, it's always better to leave a little space rather than overlap into the, the line above. Looks really nice. All right, let's move on to another one. So this is the second quilt like this I've done for Jane. She's done a second one. This is all done with clothing as well. So this middle, you can see the heart shape that's created with the heart applique. So each one of these hearts are individually applique and then the entire thing gives off the heart look as well. She has done a um, buttonhole stitch for all of her applique. She has changed the color of thread depending on the um, fabric color as well. So really cute. I love how all the hearts are turned different directions and to create that effect. And then we have this um, square border. Great way to use up some of the fabrics from the clothing around the edges. This uh, white here and then around the, the outside border is all a solid white color. And on the backing, we did a gray, a solid gray color. It shows off the quilting really well, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Also did the binding on this for Jane, and she used um, scraps left over from the clothing, so it's all a scrappy binding all the way around. And that's a really nice effect around all of that white. So the um, pantograph, I chose a different pantograph than I used when I did the, the first one of these for. For Jane and that's probably been a month or two ago now um, on the first one I believe I did deer heart pantograph and it was really cute but recently I discovered this pantograph my um, online membership quilt circle someone posted a picture of a valentine quilt that they had done and they had this uh, pantograph on it and I had to find what it was this is called vintage valentine and this is done by um, TK Quilting Designs, and I will lo link this down below as well. This is so, so super cute. So you've got um, the hearts with the little curly cue on the inside and some bubbles, some different size bubbles, and then a heart as well, you know, the other open heart. Just a really cute um, shape to this heart. I really like, I really like the plumpness of this heart as along with the, the, um, the swirls of this one. So it does have some overlapping. You can see overlapping meaning it stitches back over itself just a tiny bit off, not even like an eighth of an inch. So it's not stitching exactly on the same line, but just about an eighth of an inch away as it comes back out of that heart and does the swirl on the other side. And then this swirl here, the same thing. It doesn't stitch back over the top of itself, but it's not a very wide um, opening there, just maybe an eighth of an inch. So this one, um, pretty straight. It doesn't nest up into the other line quite so much. You can kind of see how these are pretty close right here and actually they touch right here. Um, but that is where one dot design ends and the next one starts. So almost like a, um, a square type pattern there that just matches up. So really cute. We used a white thread on this one. It shows up really well on the backing fabric, but blends in with the white from the borders um, right there. 
Again, I use a scoop foot on this, or the glide foot is what Handy Quilter calls theirs. It goes over this applique. Actually, Jane's applique, all of it was stitched down very well. There wasn't anything poking up at all, but sometimes you have those thicker seams, especially when you're using, when you're doing t-shirt quilts or you're doing quilts that have clothing in them, you're gonna have some thicker parts. Some of this is flannel, some of it is cotton, um, some of it's almost like a jersey type material, and some of those are pretty thick. So I really like that glide foot. I use it all the time, and um, the glide foot will just go right over those thicker seams. It's not gonna get caught where your, where your metal shank, um, the metal foot might get just stuck on some of those. This glide foot goes right over, so I use it all the time. You can't use a glide foot with rulers if you're doing that. Um, a glide foot also keeps you away from your bars a little bit because it's it's wider than the the metal foot is so if you're needing to get into some really close spots maybe your um, backing fabric isn't isn't quite wide enough and you've got to get really close to those leaders or something and you'll need to switch to a metal foot where you can um, you don't have to have quite that um, extra that, that is built in, like on the glide foot. So, you know, a glide foot is a good inch wide, maybe inch and a half wide, so um, so you do have, you're a little farther away from the bars or the leaders when you're doing that. But I super, super like the glide foot. Um, just don't have to change it much at all, so. All right, I have a second one by Jane hiding behind here. Jane's second quilt is super, super pretty. This is a very large quilt, 93 by 106. This is um, was actually a block of the month program that the um, my local guild put on last year, so the 2023 block of the month. I will link pattern down below if I can get a hold of it. Um, this pattern has a little bit of everything. So you have regular piecing in your blocks here. You have some foundation paper piecing in the, the parts here. You also have some applique done in these here. So a great skill builder. Um, Jane is a newer quilter. She's only been quilting for a couple years. Her neighbor got her involved and she did an incredible job for being new, uh, a new quilter. So you've got things set on point. You've got these skinny borders. I mean, it's got just about everything. Jane used batik fabrics on this. Very bright, um, feels like um, uh, you know a, a Florida summer is what it feels like to me. Just very bright fabrics, all batiks, um, oranges and yellows and the bright blues and bright purples, just so pretty. Her applique, she um, did a buttonhole stitch as well on all of her applique and she did use the same color thread um, as the, the fabric that she was stitching over. So purple for the purple, darker green for this leaf. There's nothing on the pink part because you get um, both sides of this done when you're doing the two green parts. So the light green, you stitch on the light green part, the, the dark green, you're stitching on the dark green part, and that encases the pink, so nothing there. So I folded this over so you can see the border. The border does have, very similar to a piano key type border, um, you've got some shorter lengths of batiks then longer but you've got this yellow square on top of each one of them so it kind of builds it now jane added for her she added another white border around the edge um i have a couple more of these same quilts coming in to be long arm quilted and not everyone added this extra border this makes it bigger it kind of gives your eye some space to rest from this p piano key before you get to the binding so it was really nice for the backing fabric, let me flip this over so you can see Jane's backing. So this is the back of Jane's quilt, and on this she took extra batik fabrics that she had left. She created this large, this one is a multicolor batik here. So it's a large rectangle, and from that she did straight strips of batiks that way, straight strips batiks that way, and then both up and down. This is not centered on the back, which is a very nice effect. This is actually 
um, top right hand corner or bottom left hand corner depending on which way you orient the quilt and then the rest of the backing is all this yellow batik that you see here very bright very fun um, just, she just did a really nice job it's not easy getting those straight lines and she did a really nice job with that for the um, we also did the binding on this one for Jane she used a purple batik as the binding all around the edge a nice finish that gives it a nice um, frame around the edge of the quilt for pantograph I think you probably can see it best on the white this is also a new pantograph in, um, that I have been using. This is called Adore. And the, you can see this pantograph has this little bit of a leaf here. It does have some swirls. Um, it does have just, um, you know, you can see the swirls going out here. This is where it doubles over on itself so that it looks like a ribbon. We've talked about that before, but it also has the hint of type of feather, but almost on top of that swirl. So almost like a fan type. Um, feel to it depending on which way you you turn the quilt and then with this little leaf so I thought this was a great way of adding in um, some swirl some some circular movement but then also with the hint of the leaf with the batiks because on the front we have a lot of angles we have a lot of this back um, around so you can see the front of it again this middle part that was all done by the foundation paper piecing um, very angular but almost um, flower type feel or star type feel to it. So because a lot of the angles, I didn't want to do anything that was too straight lined um, because if anything was off either my end or her end, you were going to see it. So by going with something a little more round, it adds in some of that um, floral feel to it. Um, and I just really like this pantograph. I thought it was a nice, a nice fit for this type of a quilt. So the whole center of it is done kind of like in a medallion type um, look to it. So you've got the center block set on point, piece blocks around that, you have the skinny borders around that, then the applique borders around that, and more pieced. So it's just a continuation of adding from that center part. White thread for all the pantograph um, that blends in with the white um, background fabric. Shows up really nice on the yellow on the back as well. I really like that. Just a really, really pretty quilt, nice and big. Um, the next two quilts that I have just like this, because this was my local guild here, I'm getting several of these in. Um, we're doing different pantographs on each one of them, so it'll be interesting to see, to compare the look of each one. And pantographs really kind of depend on um, the quilter as well, not me, but the piecer, because they everybody has a different style. Every ha Everybody has different likes and dislikes. So um, there's not going to be a wrong pantograph for this. It's going to be the one that, that really speaks to the piecer and what they were thinking when they saw this quilt, um, what they were thinking when they made this quilt, the feel that it gives to them, maybe where they're going to um, keep it at. Is it going to be on a bed? Is it going to be in the Midwest? Is it going to be in Florida? Is it, you know, there's so many different components that go to it. So you're not picking a wrong pantograph. It's what appeals to you and what your likes and dislikes are. So that's Jane's quilt. I'm beginning that back to her today. And I know she'll be super excited to see it. All right, I have one more quilt to show you today. And this is Brenda's quilt and this is so cool because this is a very um, similar design in that it's done in a, a medallion type of middle panel um, appears to be set on point but it's not we'll talk about that in just a minute and it's again batik fabrics but a totally different feel from Jane's quilt where Jane's was the bright um, bold batiks this is more the autumn and the the cooler tones of batiks, just so, so pretty. So this is done all in squares. So no foundation paper piecing, no um, applique, no setting on point. This is done in squares all the way around. So you start with your center blue one, then you ha then um, Brenda has the brown, and then the red, and then the blue, and then the green, and then the blue, and then the way it's set out, it is just done 
in squares. These are probably um, probably four inch squares, I'm guessing. I've not measured those, um, but super, super pretty. Just a totally different feel from the other one, but very similar in many ways. Many differences, but many similarities too. So these batik prints are very pretty as well. So the white that she has used as her background, not quite a, a, um, a total solid white, but such a low contrast that you really have to get in close to see. It's not a design, it's more um, maybe sort of a grunge, but maybe a, just a very, very, very um, low volume grunge. I'm not sure the exact the, um, fabric that that is. So Brenda says this is, the pattern is called Illusions. It is a Marty Mitchell pattern. All of the batiks are from KPT Batiks, Hoffman and, ah, the background fabric is a grunge, <laughs> if I would just read her notes, right? So this is called white paper grunge. And like I said, it is such a low volume um, that you really have to get in close to see that it is a grunge, but it's really cute. So um, Hoffman and Kaufman Batiks, all Jordan fabrics, KPT Batiks from Michaels, and then the backing is a KPT Batik from Michaels as well. And let me flip this over to show you the backing. And there is the backing of Brenda's quilt, just continuing that whole autumn feel to it, the browns. Um, if you don't know, I recently was introduced to how batiks were made. So back in January for my birthday, we did a 24-hour trip to Missouri Star. I've never been to Missouri Star quilt town there, uh, Jenny Doan's place, and I'd never been there. And we needed to uh, meet another family halfway between here and Minnesota. And we discovered that Missouri Star was just about halfway. So we did a 24-hour trip, probably on the coldest day of January. But it was right after my birthday. So my husband said that it was a great place to meet because he could treat me to um, a birthday trip as well. And if you're familiar with Missouri Star, she has a whole town full of quilt stores. And each quilt shop has a different theme. And they have a boutique quilt store there. When you go there, then they have a video running in the back that shows you how batiks were made. And I had no idea. I had I, I didn't know. <laughs> um, and I'll see if I can link if there's some videos online or if I can link to the ones from Missouri Star and let you see. But how they are done is they actually make a die. If you can think of um, almost like a rubber stamp die. Now it's different materials and I'm not going to get this totally right. But um, it's if you, similar to the theme of a rubber stamp, okay? And they dip that stamp into waxy type of substance. Um, that waxy substance then is then pressed onto the fabric. It's just a plain um, white or cream color fabric, whatever. And they press that waxy part all over that fabric, all over. Then they take that fabric and run it through the dyes. So through the browns or the, or the, I don't know how they get the different colors. I don't know. But everywhere that the wax is, the dye doesn't stick. And so that's why you get these, um, the prints here. And that's how it's done. Isn't that incredible? And then they lay out those large um, fabrics out on the ground to dry. You'll have to find it. It's just an incredible um, an incredible industry that's done there. So that's how batiks are made. It just gives me a whole new appreciation for it. So very, very pretty. I love the browns. I love the, um, the autumn feel to it. So the pantograph for this one is called Lemon Peel. And where you have the three little loops here, just kind of a very, you know, it kind of plays off some of the, the batik patterns that are here. In this blue one, you just see a sort of a leaf one. In the green, you see a sort of a leaf one. And so this just kind of reminded me of it and adds some of that. Um, circular movement, but again, repeats the um, the fallish feel to it, and I really like this one. So this one, we did a white thread, again, because of the white background fabric. I don't want to, um, not on this quilt anyway, did I want to cover up and, um, and distort any of that white. You wanted to kind of keep that as uh, pristine as possible, because that kind of sets off the whole design. If that is muted or colored in any way, then you're gonna lose this center feel, the medallion feel that you get um, with that stark white there. There are a couple borders around the edge. You can see she's got a little bit of a blue border and then that, that um, diagonal feel comes out and um, stops right there with that one last dark square and then she's done a skinny brown border around the edge. 
So very, very cute. So, so fun. Um, Brenda did a really nice job. This is a very large quilt list too. This one measures 104 by 104. So very, very pretty. All right, I did have several baby quilts that already went home this week. Now that I'm running two machines, I'm not gonna be able to show everything that um, I do each week. And um, so I'll just kind of pick out the highlights and I hope you'll bear with me as I try to figure out my, <laughs> my setup here and what's best, how to show you best um, the quilts and the pantographs and how to be able to get in close and my lighting and everything. It's kind of all, all new again and so I'm gonna have to figure all that out again. As I go through and edit these videos, then I'll be able to make adjustments as I need, but I appreciate your comments and suggestions as well and that would be a help to me also. So I hope this week you make lots of time for quilting. As you can see from the quilts I've had in here today, every quilt is worth finishing, whether it's a super large one, whether it's an antique quilt, whether it's a table runner, they're all worth doing. They are part of your, your quilt journey and they need to be finished. So if you are in need of long arm quilting services, you can find my information down below. I would love to work with you. And until next week, I hope you make lots of time to quilt because every quilt is worth finishing. Bye-bye.